I'm happy to be here. Hi, how are you? My name is Matt Monero. You see it on the board. Please don't call me Mr. Monero. Call me Matt. Um, I know J.J. Pierce. I used to speak um, and do a junior achievement class. I'm looking for some familiar faces in here. I don't see anybody that I know before. But I spoke here uh, last year, um, and we did a series of, uh, we did uh, 12 weeks in a row every day, uh, once a week, and I did um, three classes back to back to back for Callie, uh, Miss Haverford, I think her name is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was the class in which the kids pretty much had no interest in going on to college, and so basically at noon they left school, they left J.J. Pierce, and they would go to work. You guys know what I'm talking about? Anybody familiar with that? It was an interesting group of kids because I really related to those kids. Um, and I don't know what we have with this class, but I hope to connect with you guys on a couple things. We should automatically have a connection because, what's your name, my friend? Uh, Gentry. Gentry? Yes, you, you ever heard of a guy on the internet called Tay Love? I don't think so. No? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, that's Tay Love right there. <laughs> and Tay Love has a huge following for people with dreads. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. He's like the dread expert on YouTube. So. <laughs> But his real name is Billy, and Billy and I have worked together for the last, I don't know, six, seven months. Um, there's no reason that a guy 49 years old, uh, you know, brings Tay Love to videotape stuff, right? I mean, the reality is I don't need to be doing any of this. I could just stay in my office and um, make all the money I could possibly want and not do any of this. But I really enjoy this because I look back when I was your age, and the only thing I remember is that I was lost. Somebody give me a road map. Somebody show me the way, right? You see, you gotta understand my story. I, my real dad left when I was six months old. He was gone, poof, out. I never saw him again. He left my mother and I high and dry, gone. Moved in with my grandparents. My grandparents were immigrants from Ireland, literally came over on the boat, Anybody here is first generation? Nobody? My grandparents were immigrants, man. My grandfather was a milkman and my grandmother was a maid, cleaning toilets. So to achieve what I've achieved was a pipe dream for me, man. It never, I never in a million years thought it was possible, especially after my mother remarried. And she married a bad guy for most people. For me, it turned out to be a gift. And every day, when I was your age, my father called me stupid and idiot and retard and moron every day, drilled it into my head that I was worthless and that I was gonna go no place. The only thing that saved me was sports. So who, who do we have in here that are athletes? Wow, a lot of people, awesome. It's the only thing that saved me. It's the only thing that gave me a chance to believe in myself. The downside was nobody came to help me. I wasn't getting it at home. My grandfather was a milkman. My grandmother was a maid. They didn't know anything about college or school. Heck, my grandfather went to the fourth grade. I didn't have a coach that came and took me underneath his wing. Nobody. I didn't have a friend's dad, an uncle. Nobody came out of the woodwork to say, hey, Monero, you got some talent. I think you should go in this direction. So when I sat in classes, just like you guys are right now, I was like, man, somebody show me that I got some talent. And I hope that today I can tell you all that you got talent. You may not see it yet, but what your life looks like right now is not how it has to look like in the future. If you don't like the way your life looks right now, you can change it. If you love the way your life looks right now, I can tell you, you better keep that momentum going because life might throw a few things at you as well. No one taught me about college. I applied to one school, I got in, it was a cooking school. I went there to be a chef. That's it, that's my guidance. Okay, go. My old man never went to the college with me. I never toured a college. Anybody, who's seniors in here? You guys touring colleges? Raise your hand if you're touring colleges. Your parents take you? Go ahead, guys, it's okay to do this, it's all right. We can talk about it. No, really, my point is, You've got already this support staff that's helping. Your parents are giving you guidance. Literally, my old man was like, whatever you want to do, go do. I don't care, but I ain't paying for it. My college was so cheap. It's the only school I got into. So off I went to a place called Johnson & Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island. I thought I was going to be a chef. 
That's it. It's the closest I got to academics. I got out of college. I was 25 years old. I was totally lost again. Did not know what was going to happen with my life. And I was working in California. I moved out to California to try to get a shot, a fresh start at things, right? Who knows? Anybody from California? Anybody visit California? We heard of the Golden Gate Bridge. Can you guys visualize the, the sort of burnt orange bridge that's there? And I moved out there and I stayed there for a couple days and I said, I don't like San Francisco. So all I had was a bicycle, literally a pedal bike. And I started at the base of the Golden Gate Bridge and I rode that bicycle all the way down the Pacific Coast Highway, the jagged coastline, all the way to Mexico. It was 800 miles. I didn't have a sleeping bag. I didn't have any clothes other than the clothes on my back and this bike. And the first campsite that I rode my bike into the very first night out of San Francisco, there was a big sign that said, Warning, lots of bike thefts recently. Be very careful not to get your bike stolen. Lock your bike up, right? I didn't have a lock, I didn't have anything. I didn't have a tent, I didn't have a sleeping bag, nothing. All I had was my bike, the clothes on my back, and a knife. And I said, somebody try to steal my bike, they're gonna get it tonight, man. Nobody's taking my bike, right? I'm getting to Mexico. <coughs> I moved back just up the coast a little bit because a buddy of mine had a place. He was renting a place and I stayed with him and I started riding that bicycle 14 miles inland every morning to a moving company to move boxes, manual labor, which is what I'd done to put myself through college. And I moved this guy into this big mansion, like this oceanfront mansion. It was so gorgeous. It was something I never even knew existed. And we kept putting this furniture into his garage, right? We would move the nice stuff into his house and then these other things into his garage. And finally, being a hustler, right? being a budding entrepreneur. I said, what are you doing all that stuff in the garage? He said, I'm gonna take it down to my daughter's house and my son-in-law's house. They're gonna take that stuff from us. And I said, well, don't hire this big moving company that I'm working for, let me do it, right? Let me go ahead and move that stuff for you. And he said, great. So I rented a truck, me and my buddy, and I moved that, all that stuff into that guy's house. And when I came back to the guy's house to get paid at the big mansion, he asked me one question, I'll never forget it. He said, you seem like a really talented guy. What are you doing moving boxes? Why are you doing this manual labor? You seem like a talented guy. You guys see where I'm going with that story? Where am I going with that? It's the first time somebody took a recognition from me. It's the first time a perfect stranger came out of nowhere and said, man, you got talent. What the heck are you doing doing this manual labor for? I said, I'm looking for a roadmap, man. I'm looking, I'm searching. I don't know where to find it, I'm looking. And he said, well, the guy that you just moved all those boxes in for owns a little company and they finance trucks. He's hiring. He just called me, said he liked you. Why don't you go interview with the guy? I said, okay. I rode my bike to this guy's office about 25 miles. I stashed my bike in the, in the bushes. I went into a taco uh, bueno, put on a suit that I borrowed from my buddy, and I walked in and I interviewed my butt off. And the guy hired me on the spot, and he slid me keys to a company car, and I put the bike in the trunk, and I rode back to the, to the beach. I'm still in that business today. I was with that guy for two <coughs> years. He transferred me to Dallas, Texas. This is 1995. You guys weren't even born yet. And I moved into this dumpy one-bedroom apartment over on um, the tollway and Frankfurt Road. Right, literally, the tollway stopped there. That's before your time. The tollway literally stopped at Frankfurt Road. And that's where I moved in. And um, he left me for dead. That guy literally left me for dead. Transferred me to Dallas, Texas to open up an office for them, get some business going, and he literally wouldn't even return my phone calls. So I said, well, I guess I don't need these guys anymore. I'll do it on my own. And in November of 1995, I had a phone and a folding table and a yellow pages. Does anybody know what a yellow pages is? You know what that is? What, what do you think it is? Uh, this is pre-internet, y'all. <laughs> yeah, like no, it is. No, it's a phone book. It's a big, big, thick phone book. And if you're a plumbing company, and your plumbing company is called A Affordable Plumbing, you are under the plumbing section of the phone book and hopefully because you're with an A, the customers call you first. 
And then what other people did was they ended up with AA affordable plumbing and then eventually it got crazy. It was like AA, AA affordable plumbing just so they showed up number one on the ranking. That's before Google. You guys follow me? That's pre-internet search engine optimization. And I started cold calling out of that yellow pages. Perfect strangers. You buying any equipment? You buying any equipment? You buying any equipment? I didn't even know how I was going to do it. You buying any equipment? You buying any equipment? Yeah, I'm buying something. Boom, let me go ahead and do the financing for you. And then six months into that deal, I looked out my bedroom window only to see the repo man driving off of my car. Anybody know what the repo man is? When you don't make the payments, they take your stuff. He drove off of my car. I didn't have a friend of a friend of a friend. I had no customers. I had no money. And now I had no car in this dumpy apartment. And I literally had $40 to my name. Some of you in here probably got more than 40 bucks in your pocket right now. I had $40 to my name. It was on a Shell gas card. You know what I'm talking about? Like the gas station. And there happened to be one at the corner of Frankfurt and the Tollway. And I walked to that Shell gas station and I bought $40 worth of milk and frosted flakes. And I walked back to that dumpy apartment and I said, it's time for me to take control of my life. No more waiting. No more looking for somebody. No more looking for a handout. No more looking for who's going to give me the roadmap. It's time to make my own roadmap. And since that time, 23 years later, our company's done over $2 billion. We'll do $170 million a year. We're the largest independent finance company in the transportation space in the country. And, um, and I make more money than I can spend. Anybody can do it. All you got to do is make that decision. You just got to say, I'm not waiting anymore. Now, for you, you're living somebody else's roadmap for the most part. You guys are being told this is what your life's going to look like, right? And for most of you as seniors, do we have any juniors in here? The rest of you are mostly seniors. What's that next move for you? What are you guys being told? Let's talk about it. Open up to me, please. Tell me what that next move is. You're being told that you're going to go to college, right? How does that sit? How do you guys feel about that? Let's talk about it. Do you guys feel? Don't be afraid of it. I'm only here for two sessions. Don't be afraid of it. Do you guys think college is for you? It's okay. Listen, I want it to be for you. Does anybody think it's not? Because if you think it's not, you might be afraid to say it because so many people just said that they want to go, right? It's okay if college isn't for you. Let me give you a few examples of people who never went to college, right? Who's got an iPhone? Everybody? Who's the founder of Apple? Steve Jobs go to college? He did for one year and then he dropped out. Anybody know how to use a Microsoft product? Who's the founder of Microsoft? Did Bill Gates go to college? One year at Harvard, dropped out. How about the founder of Facebook? Who's that? Zuckerberg go to college? <coughs> One year, went to Harvard, dropped out. Okay? It's not a guarantee, y'all. It's not a prerequisite. You do not have to go to college to be successful. The one thing you do have to go to college for, if that's the route you're going, is to learn the most important possible skill any of you in this room could learn, whether you go to college or not. It's the single most important skill you have to learn. It is the skill of non-judgment. It is the ability to get along with everybody. Because listen to me carefully, please. The most successful person in this room is not the person you think it's going to be. My dear respect for the quarterbacks and the football players in here, the odds are you won't be the next Zucks. Zucks didn't play quarterback, and neither did Steve Jobs, and neither did Bill Gates. Okay? It's someone that you don't think that's the person who's going to win in business. Okay? Look, I can think back on the most popular kids I went to high school with. One of them is in jail. She was the prettiest girl in the whole school. She's in jail now. Okay? The most important skill you guys can take away right now in high school or in college is the ability to lose judgment. It don't matter what you look like. Hell, why would a business guy like me be hanging out with Tay Love all the time? We should not be buds. It don't set up very well, does it? That me and Tay Love, Tay's got, he got tats on his neck, y'all, okay? It doesn't set up that Tay Love and I are gonna be good buddies, but we're buddies because we respect each other. He does great work, I do great work. We respect each other through the work, okay? 
We don't look the same. We don't have the same background. We don't have the same upbringing, but we want the same thing. We want to win, okay? We're interested in doing great work and winning. Number one thing I can offer you guys today is the ability to work on your lack of judgment. Accept people for who they are. I told you what I do for a living, right? Does anybody remember what I do for a living? Please tell me if you do. I finance truckers. So that big rig that's going up and down the road, we're one of the finance companies that finances that. I learned very early on to lose judgment with those guys. Because if you look at the guy who rolls up in front of my office and he's got, he's got blue overalls on and a white worn out t-shirt and maybe even some corn cob coming out of his pipe, you know what I'm talking about, those old corn cob, I mean, they we're talking real hillbilly, right? Most of the time those guys have perfect credit. They never miss a payment. And then you get the guy who rolls up in the, in the, in the Range Rover and he's got the diamond bezeled Rolex on and he looks real sharp, he's got pointy toed shoes and he comes to me for a loan usually a default. It's one of the most important skills I learned in my business, the inability to judge. Just treat everybody the same because somebody in this class and somebody in this school is going to be the next Steve Jobs. And if you're not talking to that person and you're not looking at that person as though they can bring you benefit, you're missing out. Okay? No judgment. Leave that. Let's open a little bit of Q&A and then I'd like to go to some, Q, some, some questions because I know Miss Brenda has been smart enough to put a little incentive, which is one of the things I want to talk about. There always has to be some incentive behind everything you do, and I know that you guys got a little incentive, so you ask questions, you get points. I love that. So what do we got? Let's go a little Q&A for everybody real quick, and then I'll move back to some stories. Yes, sir? What was your college experience like? Hmm. Hmm. It's a great question, my friend. Um, you could not have picked a better college experience for me. Uh, very little academics, tremendous social. Um, uh, we actually, um, uh, has anybody seen the movie Animal House in here? You guys ever seen that movie? You know the movie I'm talking about? It's like as crazy as college could possibly be. That's what we tried to emulate my college existence as. We, we, like crazy, like throwing kegs through windows and all that stuff. I mean, it was nuts. But, but a couple things did happen, though. Uh, me and a group of guys, we started a fraternity. We were not fraternity guys, right? We literally, the school didn't have fraternities. And somebody came up with this crazy idea that we should start a fraternity because then we control the party, right? That's a business lesson, number one, right? Create demand that doesn't exist. And so we created demand in the form of a fraternity. And... Um, and now, I graduated college in 1991, so somebody help me with the math on that. That's, what, how many years is that? 27 years? 27 years? Yeah. There's something like 20 fraternities and 30 sororities on campus, and we were the first ones ever to, to start it. So it's an interesting question. I know it may not be the, example, the answer you were looking. Maybe you thought that, you know, oh, I spent all my time working on entrepreneurship and business, right? I studied and studied and studied. I didn't. I enjoyed the heck out of college, right? It's one of the luxuries when you pay for your own college. Nobody telling you what you got to do, okay? That's another business lesson too, right? When you control your own paycheck, you also control your own time. Okay, good question though. Anybody else? Yes? Did you ever have a mentor? It's a great question. Billy's heard me say this way too many times. He knows the answer. I'm, unfortunately, I never had a mentor. And I, I know that there had to have been someone, guys, who was the teacher and I was the student, I just couldn't see it. But the reality is I didn't. I didn't have it at home, I didn't have it on the field, I never had it in business. So I had to create my own mentors. And so I never had a physical mentor, but I have thousands of them from tapes and videos and books. So if you, if you guys were to see my book collection at home, you, you would think that I am like an academic. I mean, I have literally read thousands of books on business I have listened, does anybody, you guys remember cassette tapes, or is that a little bit too, look at you all laughing at me for cassette tapes. <laughs> you love cassette tapes? Yeah, I used to have them in my cool. mom's old car when I was younger, but then she got a new one and it doesn't have them. That's my, I had the same problem too. It's why I held, I had this old beat up car that everybody in my office drove a much nicer car than me, and they would give me a, a real hard time about this old car that I drove, but I drove it because I had hundreds and hundreds of tapes, and that car still had a cassette player in it, and I could listen to my tapes to and from work everywhere. I still do it uh, today. Every day I listen to something. But um, you can find mentors wherever you need them. For you guys, it's even easier with a thing called YouTube. 
right? I mean, you can find an audience for anything that you're looking for, and that's pretty doggone cool. I used to go to a place called Half Price Books. Who knows that place? And then, because I was so broke all the time, I would go to the clearance rack in the back, and I would look for motivational tapes, and I would grab them, and I would be able to buy, like, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill for 99 cents. Can you imagine that? I mean, I would just buy like $5 worth of tapes, and I would just burn through them. And here's one thing I learned. You'll never believe this. But when I would buy those tapes, say there were eight tapes to a cassette package, invariably, the first tape was listened to about halfway, and the other seven were never even started. That's a lesson. Most people are just dipping their toe in, y'all. If you go a little bit further, you will get way further ahead than most people. I think your moms all have it wrong. Your moms have probably told you that this, the first step is the most important step, right? Just start. It's not true. Starting doesn't mean anything. It's the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth step. The ability to stay in the fight longer than the other person, that's how you win. Starting doesn't mean anything. Starting in business is when the person gets their business cards done, right? Hey, you start that business yet? No, I'm still working on my website, man. Yeah, we're trying to work on the color combination. We really want to see it. Should it be red or should it be? You'll see the post on Facebook, right? Hey, this is our company's new website. Should we go with blue or should we? Who cares? You got any clients? You got any business? Right? It's a great question, though. I encourage everybody to go and get your hands on a mentor. It's so important, and I missed it. I didn't understand it. Listen, I come from nothing. And unfortunately, when you come from nothing, you think other people don't want anything to do with you, right? It's a tough lesson to learn. Someone in this audience knows what I'm talking about. Some of you, someone in this audience has a hard time at home. And I know exactly what that feels like. And it's not what's coming to you externally at home. It's what you're manifesting internally at home. I know about that anger. And I know about that sadness. And I know about that despair. I feel it. And I ain't stupid enough to think that the world's changed. It's happening. I don't care whether you go to J.J. Pierce or where I go in South Lake. I don't care where you go to school. I don't care how much money the environment has. That same tragedy is happening in houses. It's because the parents are too doggone busy. They got to work. They got to put a roof over their head. They don't have time for you. I get it. And sometimes it's because maybe you just drew the short stick on the parent's side, like I did. I get it. Look, let me, let me just finish on that thing because I don't want you guys to feel bad for me because I don't feel bad for me. That adopted guy, the adopted dad, everything he did for me was a gift. Everything he gave me was a gift. I didn't know it at the time. I know it now. I know it for the last decade and I know it for the rest of my life. By the way, I have a good relationship with the guy. Talk to him a lot. There'll be some tough conversations that he and I will have to have sooner or later about why did you talk like that? Why did you act like that? Why did you miss that opportunity? But all those things were gifts for me because I ended up building such a thick skin that when I was in that dumpy one bedroom apartment cold calling out of the yellow pages and everybody was telling me to go pound sand, they're not interested, you got nothing, quit, go work for a bank, I didn't know any better. I had big thick alligator skin. I just kept doing this. I was too stupid to stop. And I did it till the tide turned, okay? And I actually started to have a little bit of a business. Um, but that, that, listen, in 23 years, we have cycles. 1995, when I started my company, was a very tough time. 0102, after September 11th, which we just had the, the memory of that. <clears throat> that was a tough time. And anybody know about the Great Recession? Who knows about the Great Recession of 0809? Anybody experience it in your house? Things were really good, and then all of a sudden, your old man was like, hey, we got to tighten up a little bit. We ain't going to Disney World this year, honey. Anybody have that happen? Yeah? Well, that certainly happened. What are you going, like this? Like, kind of. Yeah, because I mean, it's kind of tight, but like. <laughs> tight like as in your dad's frugal? Well, my mom. Uh, your mother's frugal? Because uh, it's just me and her, but it's like. Ah. Kind of hard, so. Mm. But like, I mean, you still feel it. It's just always kind of used to it. Okay, you mean the money's tight? Yeah. I got it. I got it. Anybody else know that feeling? Come on, man. Haven't I not poured it out to you already? You guys can share anything with me, man. I've been through it all. Let's not start with that, where we're not ready to admit. Come on, man. It's tight sometimes. You might have to be the person that changes that. You may have the luxury of being able to start from nothing 
and fix your entire family situation. Let me, let me, let me work on that for a second with you all because that's what, that's what brings up this book, which is probably the only reason that we met. Is because I spent $100,000 promoting this book on Facebook. Uh, this book is the story of my brother-in-law, my wife's only brother. He died, 46 years old. He left a wife and four children with no money. And my wife and I were able to take care of all of his bills. We paid for everything. And uh, he died almost one year to the day after he was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and that year in which we were able to pay all those bills and spend that unbelievable amount of time with him was the greatest gift I've been able to give back. So I, I connect the dots because if you're short, if money is real tight, if there's more month at the end of the money, there's a lot of people in the same boat, but that doesn't have to be you because you want to put yourself in a financial position where you can help the people you love. They may not be able to help themselves. My brother-in-law was not able to help himself financially. Every time he made money, he lost money. He made money, he lost money. He made money, he lost money. And he felt tremendous guilt about that when he got sick and he couldn't provide for his family anymore. But he didn't have to worry about that because I took care of that, right? You want to be in that position, you guys. I need you to understand if you take something away from today, take away that money is not something to be played with. It is a vital piece of existence. It is like oxygen. You need it. Lots of it. Don't, don't get confused that having money means you have to trade something else. You have to trade goodness to get money. There's no connection to it. None. If you're being told that, it's incorrect. There is no connection. Money is a source of happiness, period, end of story. Okay? Um, doesn't mean you have to do anything illegal for it. You can make lots of money doing playing it straight. You don't have to hurt anybody's feelings or cheat anybody. You can do it. So let's get back to Q&A for a little bit. Give me one more question because so far we only got three people that got points. I'm going to go to, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Uh, uh, Gentry. Okay, Gentry, what you got? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in me or in my roadmap or my course? Yeah, so um, I have just very few regrets in life. One is I did not serve my country as a soldier. Is anybody going to the military after school in here? I wish I did that. I really do. I wish I had given back to my country who's given me so much opportunity and freedom to do what I needed to do. The second thing that I regret is I really did let my business take over um, my life. Um, I have three boys and my business was my fourth child. And I don't regret that I didn't spend time with my kids because I always made time for my children. It was a high priority for me. Um, we'll get into this in a minute, but I created a series of core values in my life very early on. My number one core value was to be a better father to my three boys than my father was to me. It dictates everything for me. Um, but along that road, I got fat. And I, I let my health suffer. I worked instead of working out, right? I ate in crazy amounts of food, and at the peak, I got up to 331 pounds. So that's 50 pounds ago for me, but I still have at least another 50 pounds to go. But I probably put my, my high school football weight was 221. So I should probably be 230, 240, and I'm more like 280. So, um, so that's an answer to your question. If, if you want to talk about real business piece, I waited too long to scale. I was too small for too long. I wasted a decade of those 23 years. I should have been where we are today at least a decade ago. I was afraid. Right? I thought we had to just go like this. Here's a takeaway for you guys. Listen to me. You do not have to go through the increments that other people are telling you you have to go through. You don't have to go through this process of, I'm 18, graduate high school, I need four years in college, and then I'll go get a crappy job, and then maybe I'll just you know, do this, and then I'll get married at 32. You don't have to do any of that. Dude, Zucks had, Zucks had Facebook at 19. So you don't have to buy into that timeline for anybody. I bought into somebody else's timeline, which really does take <coughs> me to the big takeaway for today which is a wonderful question for you, and you should get extra points for that question because it's really insightful. The biggest thing nobody ever taught me was who was I competing against. Look, when I was in this class all those years ago, I was competing against everybody. I had such a massive chip on my shoulder for every one of you guys. I couldn't wait to beat you on a football field. I couldn't wait to try to dance with your girl at the dance. You guys got homecoming coming up? And I was like, man, I'm going to try to dance with that guy's girlfriend. I'll we'll fight in the parking lot, right? 
I was so consumed with the compete against other people, competing against my old man, competing against my friends, competing against my enemies. And I missed who I was competing against. I was competing against me this whole time. What am I capable of doing? What can I as me achieve? What can my thumbprint on this doggone universe be? And I missed it for so long. I'm telling you, I only really learned that about six or seven years ago that I was competing against myself. And once I understood that, I shed so much of that anger. I just am not that guy anymore. I literally don't have that anger. I'll tell you a story, though, of, of the worst uh, part of it all, like where really I sort of lost my mind. Um, it was around that time that we had hit $100 million a year in business. Um, that was always my goal in business, by the way. How do we get to 100 million bucks? I figured out 100 million bucks. You know, I didn't have to worry about anything, and unfortunately, I still have to worry about it. Mark Cuban, everybody know who Mark Cuban is? Shark Tank, right? Multi, multi billionaire. Mark Cuban has a great quote. He says, I thought when I became a billionaire that I would be able to coast. He says, Now that I'm a billionaire, I'm busier than I've ever been. That's what happened to us at 100 million bucks. I was like, Oh, we'll get to 100 million bucks, and I'll just take it easy. Wrong, right? We're as busy as we've ever been. Total chaos in my office. It was madness. And we had a live radio show at that time. And in my office, we have a studio. And I had an IT guy who was, uh, was bad. He always made mistakes. So we would go live. The, the color, the, the light would turn green. We'd have a live caller. I'd go, hey, Matt Monero with the Grit radio show. Hope everybody's doing great. Listen, we're going to take a caller. And caller, and the call would drop, right? And I would scream at the IT guy, get that phone fixed, get that caller back on. He'd panic and go crazy. He'd get the caller back on. He'd say, I got you back, boss. So, caller, welcome back. Dropped, right? <laughs> Live radio show. It's a nationwide radio show we're doing. And finally, one day I said to him, listen, you're going to get this right. Today is your day, pal. You're going to get it right or all heck is going to break loose. First phone call. I got you, boss. He's on. Caller, welcome to the Grit Radio Show. Dropped. And on a live radio show, I completely lost my mind. If you guys can even think this is possible, I had a desk in there. I flipped the desk. I ripped the mic out of the, the thing. And behind us, we had all these flat screens. I smashed every flat screen. I broke every light in the studio. And then I threw the mic at the guy as hard as I possibly could. And he, he went like this, and the mic went like this, right? And then when I walked out of that studio, every employee in my office was standing up looking at me. And man, they were looking at me with disgust. They were not looking at me as though I was their fearless leader, right? The guy that had got the company to 100 million bucks, the guy that had made people in my office multi-millionaires, the guy whose storyline they bought me from scratch. And we're gonna build it on mission statement and core values. I don't care what happens to it? I don't care if it goes to zero. I don't care if I go broke. I'm never going to be this guy again. And we did. We lost seven people. Seven of our top producers quit. It cost us $30 million. And, um, and today the company will do $170 million. bucks. And at that time we were doing $100. We went down to $70. And today we'll do $170. It was the single best business decision I ever made. <coughs> But most importantly, it was the single best decision I ever made in my life, right? Um, and that's kind of what brings me to you guys today. I started writing books. I got probably more followers on Instagram than any of you guys got. <laughs> and that's kind of crazy for a 49-year-old guy, right? But that's my life now. My life is not about financing trucks anymore. I got plenty of people to do that for me. I got plenty of money stacked and racked. My life is about how do I help you guys? How do I help other people? How do I help people recognize <clears throat> that no matter how bad it seems, it's all possible? That's what brings me here today. So Miss Brenda was kind enough to bring me here. She pushed me on it. I apologize for the time that I, I missed for you guys. But I want you to know that I care about each and every one of you guys. You guys can reach out to me. You can hit me up on social. Follow me. It's Matt Monero everywhere whether it's on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, whatever you, however you want to follow me, do that. Hit me up with an email. And uh, let me help you. You asked if I ever had a mentor. I didn't. I can mentor a lot of people now. Social media is the most amazing gift in that regard, you know. Every single day. There is not one day that goes by. Just before I came over here, I got another one. 
Every day I get an email from somebody thanking me for writing this book. Every single day somebody says, you did something that helped my life. It's an incredible gift. It's unbelievable. This book never lived in me, by the way. Lots of people say, oh my God, you ever heard that? Oh, that book's been in me for a decade, right? It's, it, was, it had to come out of me. It never had to come out of me. I never had an interest to write a book ever. It's just a story that happened. I wrote a little short story about it, got picked up by an agent who said, we think we can sell the rights to it. And they paid me 100 grand to write the book. And I said, I'll put it all back into Facebook advertising. And I built an audience for it. Interesting. Not an audience like some people, but from a guy that had no audience, I end up with a little bit of an audience. By the way, money can buy an audience, you know, right? I didn't buy likes and followers and views and all that sort of stuff. I just bought ads and pumped the heck out of the book. And now it's, um, this book just hit 44 on Amazon two weeks ago. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Let's go back to Q&A. Yes, sir. Tell me, start with your name if you don't mind. Uh, Santiago. Okay, Santiago. How do you feel about like, trade schools such as MIT instead of like, you know, public university? Well, I don't know that I'd call MIT a trade school. You're talking Massachusetts Institute of Technology? You're talking MIT, the MIT? No. Or are you talking about it's MIT? A trade school, just a trade school in general. Is it called MIT? Uh, Give me the name of a trade school. What's a trade college where you might learn something like that? Nobody knows? By the way, I'm a huge, to answer your question, I'm a huge fan of that stuff. I really am. I'm a huge freakazoid fan of that sort of stuff. I mean, let's just bring Billy into the mix for, again for a minute, right? Because I love bringing Billy into the mix. Billy, did you go to college? <laughs> How did you learn your skill of video production and graphic design? Just did it? But what made you even want to pick up the camera in the first place? Uh, actually, it was music. I was in a music industry. Mm -hmm. And we had nobody to do our stuff, so I was like, I'll do it, you know, instead of spending money. Yeah. Picked up the camera, and that was it. Picked up the camera, started shooting our stuff, and then once some, another person saw that I did ours, they was like, hey, yeah. can you do ours? Yeah. And I did theirs. And it just started to overlap because other people saw my stuff, even though it really was bad. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Billy applied for a job at our company to do video production and all that sort of stuff. You remember the call, Billy, when I called you back? Do you remember what I said to you? Not exactly. I said, I said, listen, I've seen all your videos, right? All your Tay Love videos, all your Dread videos, all that sort of stuff. I see your follower. I said, I want to hire you but I want you to do you in my office. I don't want you to change anything. I don't want you to come in and figure out me. I want you to do you for me, for us. You guys understand what I'm saying there? I didn't want Billy to change. I wanted him to be exactly who Billy is and do the type of work that Billy does because we weren't doing a good job of it. I needed to change it and bring somebody in who knew the heck, what the heck they were doing. So Billy got hired because of his expertise. Did we, I don't even know if I even looked at your resume. I don't care where you went to school. What was the number one rule I told you guys to take away from today? I didn't care where he went to school. I don't care what he looked like. I, but he is a handsome guy. Come on, Billy's a handsome guy, right? <laughs> Billy's a handsome guy. Even all those tats, Billy's a handsome dude, man. My wife says it all the time. If it wasn't for the neck tattoo, Billy would be really handsome. <laughs> Listen, number one rule, no judgment. It doesn't matter to me. The only thing that Billy and I care about is can we work with each other and can we learn from each other and can we make each other better. If you looked at my office, it would look a lot like this classroom. All different walks of life. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. In my office, the only thing I care about is do you believe in our core values and follow our mission statement and can you finance trucks, right? It doesn't matter to me. Now, we got a couple pedigreed guys. Like one of my number one guys was uh, captain of his football team at Rice. That was pretty good. But our number one guy, multi-seven-figure personal income earner, um, I think he has an associate's degree, and he came to us. He was making like 20 grand a year selling phone systems or something like that. I don't even know what he did. He's been with me 18 years. 
And that guy's life has changed so much from working with us. Do not get me wrong. It ain't me who did it. He did it. I just happened to have the business, and he took it and ran it. Took his piece of it and ran it. But you know what he does with his money? This is the kind of people I want to work around. He takes his money. They adopted a foster child. Anybody know much about the foster program? Anybody a foster child in here? They adopted a foster child a number of years ago, and do you guys know what happens in the foster program when you're 18? Anybody? You're out. They cut, you're shaking your head. You know that? They cut you off. There's no support from the state anymore. And so when their daughter was, fit, when their daughter was 15, um, in the foster program living with them, they adopted her. And then when... 18 came around, they realized there's no more money that comes in from the state. And they said, well, wait a minute. If that's happening in our situation, what's happening to a bunch of other people in Dallas-Fort Worth? What, what happens? What, what happens to these kids? And the answer is, nothing happens. Good luck is what happens. So guess what happens to a lot of kids when they graduate from the foster program? Foster program? They get in trouble. Right? They do bad stuff. They go down the wrong path. And they said, we're going to fix that. And they bought a house nicer than the house they live in. It's called Blake's House in Plano. And they fund every nickel of that house out of their own pocket. And they bring in foster kids when they graduate from the foster program. They feed them. They clothe them. There's only two rules. You must be working or you must be in school. And no boys, three rules, right? Only for girls they do it. And they charge $250 a month for rent. So they pay all the bills, everything, but they collect in 250 bucks. <clears throat> Take a guess what they do with the 250 when the girl graduates from their house and is ready to go out on their own. What makes you say that? Is that what you would do? Well, listen, it adds up, buddy. <laughs> Come on. It could be a lot of money, man. But you're right. That's exactly what they do. They give that money back to that girl. And so she may leave with 4000 5000 6000 enough money to put first and last payment down on an apartment where she can live on her own, maybe to buy a car, something like that. It's an incredible type of give back, you know. And I challenge you guys to understand that. that, that listen, making money is just, there, there's two sides to the money street. It comes in, but you have to put it back out. If you hoard it, it doesn't come back around. The money just circles like this, y'all, right? I mean, I have some of your money, and you have some of my money. I mean, you understand that about money, right? Money is just a paper exchange, and now it really isn't even worth anything on paper. It's just an electronic exchange. So if you understand the rule of money, follow me on this. For you guys who play football, who, for non-athletes, what else you guys do? Raise your hand if you do something else. You're a good gamer, you're in the band, something else. Just raise your hand, tell me. What do you guys like to do? Band. You guys are in the band? Oh, what'd you say? Orchestra for you. What about over here? Somebody raise their hand over here. Game. Yeah, who's the Fortnite expert? Somebody's the Fortnite expert, right? Gamer. Huh? Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, would you say that there are rules in Fortnite, my friend? Sure. Of course, right? <laughs> would you say there's rules on the football field? Are you a football guy? Yes, sir. Okay, you look like a football guy. <laughs> and you guys on the band, are there rules when it comes to music? Of course, so why would there not be rules to life or why would there not be rules to music? So if you know that you can win when you get rules and you can achieve by the rules, why not learn the rules of life, right? One of the rules of money is it's an exchange. It goes in a circle, so you have to be giving it back to get it to come to you, right? Some of the rules in life, I told you, number one, don't be judgmental, right? Number two, absolutely impeccable ethics. You have to have impeccable ethics in life and in business. I'm telling you, the way you treat some people today in this school will impact you down the road. Someone in this class or in this school is you are going to need their assistance in the future. And if you apply judgment and you hose them, that hurts your chances, right? I'm a freakishly ethical dude. Even when I couldn't pay the rent, I never took advantage of a customer, ever. And I promise you, I left millions on the table selling deals way too cheap for customers, which allowed me to make millions 
from those same customers who knew that I wasn't gouging them, okay? Two major takeaways of the rules of life. Number one, zero judgment. And number two, you absolutely have to flow the money back and forth. You gotta give, okay? Let's go back to some more questions. Anybody? Like three minutes. Perfect. Last question. Cool. What you got? Yes, sir. Is there like a, is there like a typical like client that Y'all For me? Or is there a okay, listen, I want to just give you a quick tip on business, a couple takeaways on business. Number one, um, there's only two reasons to go into business, period, end of story. Don't overcomplicate it. Please, remember I told you, there's rules to success and there's rules to life and rules to music and rules to football, and rules, to, rules to Fortnite. Two rules in business. The only reason you want to go into business is to either one, be solving a problem, or two, to be going into a marketplace that is so huge that there are crumbs that you can build a business <coughs> off of, okay? So those are the only two reasons. So for me, I didn't know anything. I had no problem to solve, right? So I simply said, who's got the money? Well, big, large, publicly traded banks are doing billions of dollars in truck financing. Well, heck, there's gotta be 100 million worth of crumbs that I can go hustle my butt for, and that's what I did. We have an ideal customer, it's called a 557, five years in business, five trucks in their fleet, and a 700 personal credit score, a good credit score. That's our niche. That's the box that we play in, that's it. And so we just go into the marketplace every day. You got five units in the fleet, you've been in business five years, you got a 700 credit score, boom, we'll approve you, okay? So yes, we have an ideal customer, which is very, very important. Yes, sir, my friend. What position did you play in football? Thank you for asking, man. <laughs> I tell my boys all the time. I was the most valuable player freshman year, man. I still got the trophy to prove it. <laughs> Nose guard, center. I tell my boys I never left the field, right? I played all special teams. But what's, how, many, how many kids in graduating class here at J.J. Pierce? It's 500, 600 probably? Bigger, yeah. Bigger than that. So we had 200 kids in my graduating class. So you pretty much had to play every position. I mean, it's not like it was all that good, but that's what I played. Yeah. I actually thought I might play in college, but uh, my senior year, I got hurt, blew out my neck, and that was the end of it. That was the end of it. You know, my father never had one conversation with me about that. All right, listen, guys, I know we got a break. I care about all of you, okay? I hope you enjoyed yourself today.